Osseo. Osseo. Cherokee greeting. Wave the great feather. Wave the feather for this celebration of Native American Heritage Month. Recognition is the way that we inherit and then we can continue or begin rebuilding. That's what we're looking at these days. And starting right off from this article, Indian Country Today. How returning lands to Native First Nations is helping to protect nature is the heading of this article. From California to Maine, land is giving back, is being given back to Native American First Nations who are committed to managing it for conservation. Some nations are using traditional knowledge from how to support wildlife and to protect the ancestral grounds. Much of the campaign to return Indian land is part of the racial injustice movement that is sweeping the globe. The Seven First Nation of California, which had inhabited the Big Sur region for thousands of years, was stripped of its culture and lands by the Spanish, who built missions in their region. The Western Rivers Conservancy um, has arranged the purchase of a 2,000 acre ranch with redwood forest and crystalline stream called the Little Sur. And it's where steelhead spawn and um, they protect it, you know, to protect it and so forth. So they, anyway, they transferred this property uh, valued at $4.5 million to the Ascelin tribe 250 years after it was taken. This will protect natural values, including spotting steelhead, the California spotted owl, the California condor, and uh, habitat that connects the ocean to the Santa Lucia Mountains, as well as use the land for traditional ceremonies and plant gathering. A photo that accompanied this article was you know, really very touching to me. Um, it's sort of an aerial photo um, looking at a, an arrangement, a circular arrangement of these people on a hill there at Big Sur to realize that, to realize that we still have enough that we can continue our ceremonies even after this 250 years of foreign domination. You get it. <clears throat> In many cases, the First Nations are buying land important to them. In Northern California, the Yurok Nation owns 44 miles of land along the Klamath River. They have been piecing back their Aboriginal lands with the help of the Trust for Public Lands to protect the habitat of their primary food source, the salmon, and to have access to ceremonial grounds and other cultural landscapes. The Yurok have purchased, purchased more than 80,000 acres to add to their holdings, including 50,000 acres that were owned by the timber company that surrounded the four salmon spanning streams. They will now uh, be restored. Much of the campaign to return Indian land and to allow co-management is part of the racial justice movement that is sweeping the globe. In the American Indian community, it is called hash land back. In a recent article in the Atlantic magazine that cites the litany of forced removal and broken treaties that enabled the creation of the United States National Parks the article advocated for giving a consortium of Native Americans the ownership and management responsibility for all 
85 million acres of the national park system as uh, kind of reparations for the land that was stolen from them. The total acreage would not quite make up for the General Allotment Act, which robbed us of 90 million acres, but it would ensure that we have access to our tribal homelands, and it would restore dignity that was rightfully ours to be entrusted with the stewardship of America's most precious landscape would be a deeply meaningful form of restitution. Uh -oh. <laughs> so that's really some, some good news. Uh, the English use of land in this kind of makes it sound like you know land is a commodity. Um, but in Native America, uh, there's much more feeling about what we're talking about with land. We're talking about a real relationship. In Cherokee, Elohe would be the earth. Elohe na, well that would be her in that way. And uh, in other languages, Lakota really carries us through with Unshimaka is the earth, but it means grandmother earth. Inam maka wishona imaku, my mother gives me life. Look to the ground to see our grandmother laying there. So you can see that that's the way that we're feeling about this. And let me just take a couple of camera looks there. If you look over there at the buffalo, now the buffalo. All in all, throughout Turtle Island, ubiquitously, is all about our country. It's all about us, and it's all about the earth in which we live with. So that's you know the buffalo who never dies. And then you come over here to this shield here. This is uh, my replica. This is of a Navajo uh, dry painting. It is showing Mother Earth. It's very uh, unique, you know, very original. Um, somehow, uh, yellow is always denoting um, the Earth. It's always meaning something uh, fruitful. And here at her uh, navel, we say you can see the plants coming out. And then there's a red line like this, and this would be the sun, the sunlight, and the eagle feather. And of course, you can see the night here. So that gives us all of, of that. Now, one other thing that uh, in our relations with the earth, the Elohim, in Cherokee, we have something that's you know pretty pretty unique. So as I go, put my notes out here. Um, can you kind of go down here to to this? Crystal. Crystal is the stone of Prapi. And the Earth's crystal core, which is encoded within the planet's memory banks and the chamber at the Earth's crystal core. It also means the release of energy through creative acts of ritual and mystic achievement. Really? get that because that's what we're about. The power to which such acts of attainment give rise is the power of poetry, the power of dance, the power of music. It's the same power which animates the rainbows. So for us, intuiting that the earth herself is crystalline in nature, somehow we have the image of earth as crystal. So that's what we can see, that's how I have that here. <clears throat> now we're going to go to a Navajo story um, to illustrate something about the turkey. And we have here in, this, in the center here, uh, a turkey. 
this is a turkey here to carry this theme through. And the story is about a young man, we go over here, and he is known as the visionary. And he's had a dream vision that has somehow prompted him to go on a voyage. Now, the Navajo land is called Dinata. This is the country where the Navajos, Navajo is a Spanish uh, name for these people, the Diné. <clears throat> and the uh, boundary for Dinata is the San Juan River. It's called the River of Old Age in Navajo. And it loops up above Arizona into Colorado and then down into western New Mexico. So this fellow lives somewhere along the um, uh, San Juan River. And so what he's doing to carry out his visions, for which he's named the visionary, uh, he's going to build a watercraft to uh, somehow go through the, go down the river. He, he's got some vision of what he's doing. So if somehow he gets a, a log and he begins, you know, to shape it up with this idea. Maybe he's going to make a, a canoe or, you know, he's not really sure. He's feeling his way along. In the meantime, the divinities, you know, are all watching him since certainly by way of his vision they have uh, spawned this inspiration. And so they see that what he's putting together isn't really going to work very well. So they somehow come in and they take over the manufacturer of this water craft. At the same time, this fellow, um, the visionary, has a pet turkey. Or maybe it's his sister turkey. And I don't know the gender of the turkey. Sometimes it seems like her, sometimes it seems like him. But nevertheless, there is this pet turkey there. Well, while all these deities are busy you know, manufacturing a suitable watercraft, uh, one of them takes the turkey aside. And you can go over here and see this. Now what this is about is that this is actually a uh, petroglyph, a pictograph. It's painted on a rock. And where this is located is where, really where the visionary is going to end up. It's over in western New Mexico. And uh, there are these cliffs there. Um, they're almost swirly with tabletops on them. And there is, it seems to me uh, about, I don't know, many paintings that you could recognize turkeys or something. And this one seemed to me to be the most complete that I've replicated here. And so there's this uh, divinity here, that's what he is, and he has this hunchback. So it identifies him really as the deity of the big horned sheep. And on his head, is, you see this turkey. Now it's colored red and white. And then down here you see this uh, character has these arms, you know, turned up like that. Now you'd have to look at me for a minute to show you the camera. So you, you see that and what the character is doing, he's doing this. So you have to know Navajo to know what's going on here. I do. So he's doing this, and what that means is to transform, you know, to change. So that's very interesting in this picture that the deity is actually transforming this bird, this turkey, into something wondrous, actually. And the turkey tracks are there. Turkey tracks very much figure often in our songs and in uh, petroglyphs like that. So there we have it, you know. So we can come back down here to the visionary, I think, here. And he has a sand painting you know, behind him there. Uh, so the, as the story goes, now the watercraft is ready. Now it turns out to be much more like a submarine and not like a canoe at all. <clears throat> and somehow uh, the deities have even put in some kind of crystal uh, portholes or something, so it's not completely dark, so that he gets inside of it. And they launch him off into the San Juan River, 
heading east in this case. The turkey is not going there with him. And so I'm making a very long story, very short. So because many things happen, of course, that makes stories long uh, in his voyage. Finally, he comes to a place towards the end of his voyage where there's a whirlpool. And this whirlpool is spinning round and round. Now this sand painting here is very similar to one that accompanies the story. You see the, the way it's crossed. Um, it's a way of showing movement and on the ends of they are look like logs but they really mean that the watercraft is spinning around and the deities are standing on the edge end of it to balance it. So it comes out figuratively to look like quote a swastika and and people often uh, you know re reproduce that. Anyway, that's what it does. It spins around and around and finally lets go and lets him land on the shore. So he's landed on the shore and he steps out of his submarine and come here to a new country, a new land, and wondering what he's going to do here. And then he hears coming off of the distance the sound of his turkey. You know how turkeys sound, gobble, 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 like that. And the turkey comes, you know, and comes to him. And by this time, of course, he's pretty exhausted, so he's, you know, laid down on the ground to, to rest. And as he does so, uh, the bird, you know, puts his protective wing around him. And here we now go a little bit of change to the, in the, in the story. You can see up here, this is my rendering here of the turkey. This is actually from uh, a, an archaeological site um, in New Mexico uh, that was in ruins and it had paintings in the kiva of it. And I've replicated this from there. And so at this point I can tell you what's going on. So here's the, the turkey with her wing, because it's evident that this turkey here is female. Uh, and from her wing, all kinds of seeds are coming out, squash and pumpkin and corn, and like that. All these kind of seeds are coming out. <clears throat> And so that's the beginning here of what this mission is about. That as the turkey shakes these seeds out, and now of course the young man, the visionary, would have to know what to do with them. So the turkey actually maps out on the ground there a, a way of planting these things. It kind of makes a, a, a deliberate pattern you know, for different uh, the things that you're going to grow. So all of that <coughs> has taken place uh, and the, the upshot of this is the way that agriculture, that's what we're calling this, is being introduced to these people, the Navajo. <clears throat> From that point on, he's also rather uh, attracted to somebody there in the nearby hills where he goes and he encounters uh, what we call a deer owner. He encounters some kind of a shaman that introduces him to hunting. And while he was away for that little uh, break, you know, from his um, agriculture instruction, <clears throat> he comes back, comes back down, <coughs> and the turkey has now left. It, it, it is gone. <clears throat> and so there, he composes a little song like that. And the name of the turkey uh, was Udanuri, Udanuri. And so here, the visionary is composing this, this little thought, you know, for Udanuri. Dear Udanuri, you are the black cloud, the black mist, the beautiful rains, the beautiful lightning, the beautiful rainbow, the beautiful corn of all colors, the beautiful bean. In the days to come upon the earth, my people shall employ your feathers in their rituals. So that's you know, what he's you know, prophesied in a sense. You remember this turkey has been transformed because now he's um, not an ordinary bird. 
And at this point, uh, Udenudi flew to the east from where he had come. And all the useful, beautiful things that the visionary saw in the turkey are still to be seen in the bird. The black of black mist and the black of the clouds are there. The flash of lightning and the gleam of the, re the rainbow show up on its plumes as she walks in the sun. The rain is in its beard and the bean it carries in its forehead. The bird is sacred by its self-giving sacrifice for which it embodies the giving of the gratitude for our respect. So here you can see how the idea is about the turkey and Thanksgiving. Traditionally speaking, and I put that pretty, pretty emphatic, Native Americans do not dine on turkeys. Turkeys are more like people, or they are people. <laughs> and so they're, they're not really um, looked at as edible in that way. And there are some other things here that uh, accompany the turkey. Uh, up, up here you can see the figure that I have, that this is a kind of uh, a prayer stick, really. And here you see a turkey feather, and it's attached to uh, two sticks bound together that are pointed, and this is put into the ground. And why is that? If you can kind of see the turkey feather on the top, the white is the cumulus clouds and the black underneath means it's laden with rain and then the sheets of rain come down. So that's a way of attracting, of attracting the, the rain, the fertile rain, you know, for the crops that all have been uh, given to the visionary by the turkey. So all of that is there in this picture. So the turkey feathers here, you know, I have a, a turkey uh, fan here with turkey feathers um, to say something about the bird. Now, you can come this way for a minute. Uh, turkeys are wild. Um, that means they are not creatures of domestication like that. And the turkey itself, we want to say, you know, the prehistoric turkey, to all intents and purposes, seems to have originated here. It originated east of here in the Anza Borrego that was once a very different terrain than it is now. <clears throat> and this creature, this being, we're trying to call this you know, turkey, not a very good name. Oh, by the way, the name turkey is really from the country we know called Turkey. Because the English were importing pheasants from the country of Turkey, you know, to you know, dine on, um, that the English that came over here from England then have given the American bird the name of turkey because of that. You know, I kind of think it's too bad. Uh, they did the same thing with turquoise. <clears throat> and so where does this bird you know, come from? Well, the ancient Aztecs, they wanted to somehow uh, come up with a domestic bird here. So they experimented until they actually managed of the various variations of the turkey species to domesticate one of the many species so that it could be domesticated and cultivated for feathers and for dining. So I would have to say that all of the turkeys that people are dining on at Thanksgiving in America are really Aztec turkeys. So that's something for for the turkeys and their feathers. And many of the people back east you know, wore uh, turkey feathers for their headdresses rather than the eagle feathers. And the turkeys that live back east are pretty tall. They're pretty they're pretty big. So all of that definitely gives us some idea about the turkey, the bird and this thing that we're calling celebration. Again, 
it was what the bird, the turkey, gave to us, <laughs> like that. And I'm not sure that he, the bird was thinking he was going to be a dino. And so we have gotten that far in this. The next thing we're going to talk about here is for the day of Thanksgiving, we're here in the Coyote Creation Lodge. That's what we uh, call this place that we are the residents of. And so we, for this day, the Thanksgiving, went out east of here to the back country, is what they call it, the back country. And there, um, a, uh, a, a man, I'm trying to say his name, you know, is Amade Area. Uh, he's an orthodontologist, and he and other people have built a, a, a we call a hay, a straw Bale. hay bale house, <laughs> and try to get all that in there. And he regularly has this ceremony, which we have attended before. It's really quite wonderful and quite suitable for this particular day, nationally called Thanksgiving. So there we, you know, attended and participated in the ceremony that brings in uh, the, the earth and the plants and the birds and everything. Uh, the directions and everything all comes together in that. And where this is located, the place, uh, there's a village there, not really enough, enough to say a town, more like a village, um, called Yakuba. And it's also rendered as the place of the wild gourd. So if you come, to, come down here with the camera and see this here, this is a wild gourd from there. And what it's actually called is a coyote melon. And when they're fresh, they're green. They grow on vines, you know, along the ground. So this whole area there is an ancient sacred place. All this back country is sacred. And, you know, like a holy land. And there are many, many sacred sites. Among these sacred sites are also what is now being called yoni stones, if you understand what that is. You know, bubble formed uh, stones, some of them very, very large. And all these things that I have down, down here are all from this area here. So that's what I'm going to point, point out. Most uh, notably is this here. This is, of course, a miniature that I have I have made here to talk about something that's very important that's very uh, close to we were, where we were at Amadeo's uh, Casa. And it's called the Nawili Stone. It's very, very large and it's um, really of, uh, Nawili literally means white body. And it's also used for a very young girl. She will be called Nawili. And it also means a body louse. And so this very, very, very large stone uh, is very unusual. It's unlike anything else. It's, it's mostly white and striated in such a way that she is actually laying on her back looking at the lice in the sky, the stars, like that. So if you can make that out, this is you know, most, most important and uh, how it is regarded. So a name for, for what this is, is the mini tagara, which means form. And so she was floating in the foamy water of the sea. The universe was a mass of foam on all sides. <clears throat> so this is also, you know, a whole genesis, a whole teaching that comes about with her. Of course, the area around there has all been depopulated of the native people who had lived there. But the, the, the sacred sites such as this are still there and still legible by way of the language. So this is most significant and it's just over the hill from where we were as you approach the entrance of the village called Yakumba. There. <laughs> So this is a way, another way of 
I'm going to say expressing the earth, of expressing Mother Earth, you know, by way of the body louse. And that we can see, you know, how that's projected into um, the stars, the stars in the sky. Uh, some culture will say grain. In this perspective, we are saying they are body louse. So it's a kind of a way of recognizing we are her body louse, <laughs> her body lice, you know. Um, so that's very, very important um, in this area as very sacred. Also, if you can look at this piece here uh, that's made out of clay, and it's very unusual, and it is from there, exactly. You see her very open mouth and those slit bean eyes, and most notably there, there's a uh, furrow in her forehead. Now this is very, very ancient, you can say even archaic. And one way of showing a correlation to that. This is, uh, we come over here, Rhea Gambudis, who has written, uh, I don't know, maybe two or three of these books of the goddesses, you know, of ancient Europe. And in this particular, referring to this uh, idol I have here with the open mouth. So you can see the examples that she is showing them. One of them, you know, one, there's several of these drawings that look very much like the one that's here. And she has her interpretation of what that's about. But we're looking at an age of five to seven thousand years ago. So this, you know, it definitely is showing us that the culture that was here in the back country is stemming from that very, very ancient culture of Eastern Europe. Down here, there, there is a, uh, these are all things from there. This is a stone shaped like a turtle, uh, evidently to, you know, grind something. So you can see, you can see that. And uh, up, up above it here, here is a pot that I found out, out here. So all of these, oh, that I should go over here to the, the uh, corn and squash. So after our ceremony, uh, then we had you know a time to uh, have a communal meal, where everybody uh, consciously put together food that would you know be sacred, would be you know of the southwest, be of this region here. So all of this is all about um, ourselves being in this uh, wonderful ceremony regarding the earth. Uh, to be out there in the sacred country of the, uh, we call the back country, uh, a very, very sacred place and has much to say um, about it. Now, we can go to these drawings that I have here. So the uh, drawing that I have over here, the, if you look at this, uh, this is called, you know, Holyeya. Holyeya means to send a voice. So that's it. She's sending a voice. Here we go, like that, as as a prayer. It's not a supplication. Uh, it's different than that. You know, she's you know, calling up here to Tapuskanska, and to really look at the, at her knees there. Shalotl, shalotl. This is very much a part. It's still in Mexico. Very much a part of the way that we venerate with the knees there. So we, we do have that, <clears throat> and then pairing with that to come to this drawing, and this, this drawing is, you know, wapakila kaga, meaning uh, giving praise, giving, giving uh, appreciation. So that's what we are talking about. Thanksgiving, that's what we're doing. You know, we're, we're giving that uh, appreciation, we're giving <coughs> that gratitude, and this is my drawing that is expressing
that. Now, to finish up with this, I have a wonderful poem that really expresses this whole thing. Like again, um, everything I'm doing here is to, you know, encourage <laughs> to bring about the sympathetic resonance. You know, that uh, you like to send a voice, to send a voice. And this poem is titled, you know, More Than Something Else. And it's written by Don Ortiz. Something else, someone else, somewhere else. That place is here, in my home. We are here. I am brown, brown hair, brown eyes. Like cookies, Feather tells me. And I like to think it's perfectly cooked Pueblo cookies. My kids are something else. Nine different shades of brown. All beautiful. My grandkids are something else. Four brown eyes, two blue eyes. All native. Definitely something else. As I watch them be rowdy, be loving, be here in this world. We are here on this earth, in this time and place, in our homes, in our lands, in the cities, with our families, laughing loudly, cooking together, protecting each other. We are something else with our songs, our dances. We pray with cornmeal, eagle feathers, medicine bundles, burn some sage, make sure to acknowledge the four directions as the sun comes up. We are something else. We were here to greet Christopher Columbus. We were born from this earth, crawled out of the center of our mother's womb. We are important. We are strong. We are something else. We are Pueblo people, plains people, forest people, desert people, nomadic people, cliff dwellers, ocean fishers, fishers, lake and river fishers, hunters, medicine collectors, horse riders, artists, speakers, lawyers, doctors, teachers. We are human beings. We are something else. We are native people, indigenous to this land. We are a proud something else. Aho. Uh -oh.